What's up? This is Seth Mosley. We're on the Made It in Music podcast, and today we have a fascinating episode for you with my new friend Matt Black. Matt Black, you may know him from the electronic duo Cold Cut, who has put out many, many records over many, many years. He is a musicpreneur, I would call him, has his hand in a lot of different things. It's very inspiring. Even just in our little intro before, as we've been talking, um, you know, he's been involved with a label. He's a software developer. They have hardware uh, effects units. They're developing software for Ableton Live. He's an incredible producer. Uh, they, they have Ninja Tune, which is a massive label. Scrolling through their website, they have over 60 artists on there that they've worked with over 30 years, including Diplo, Odessa, Bicep, Bonobo, Young Fathers, and The Heavy. And so I'm really excited for this one, and I hope you guys are too. But before we jump in, just want to make one quick announcement related to an academy opportunity with the Full Circle Music Academy before we get started. Just want to highlight the Baby Steps program. If you're not already familiar with it, fullcirclemusic.com slash baby steps. Today we're going to be chatting with Matt Black, who's the creator of a new app called Jam Pro, which is really exciting. We're going to be talking a lot about business plan, how he kind of is going about creating all of that. And in Baby Step 5, we, we hit really big on how it's important for artists and people jumping into the music business to have a business plan. And so in the Baby Steps, if you're not already aware, it's an entire outline that you should be taking to have a career in the music business. And again, if you're interested in checking that out, it's at fullcirclemusic.com slash baby steps. So let's go ahead and jump into the interview. Matt Black, how are you doing today? Yo, good to be here. So thanks for having us. Yeah, I'm it, great. Well, I've I've thoroughly enjoyed getting to know you in the last five minutes that we've been chatting. And um, so where where are you coming coming to us live from? Coming live and direct from right about the centre of the UK. Actually, it's about as far from the sea as you can get near o Oxford in the English countryside. I I love it. Well, um, we have uh, a couple of our our artists over there are, are based in London. So all uh, very very much a fan of. The music that's coming out of the UK, and my wife is from Sweden, so we spend a lot of time over there in Europe. Obviously, also good good music scene in Sweden as well. But uh, London's good. where where I've been based for most of my career. So yeah, yeah. So there's a lot we could talk about. I know we're we're uh, limited on time because you're a busy man running quite an empire over there. Um, so I want to really talk. Uh, I'll, we want to talk a little bit about the history first, but really what I want to focus on today is what, what you're doing now. So um, if you're cool, I would love to start with just a quick question of what first connected you to music. I think really uh, my mum and dad used to really like music. Neither of them were musicians, but we used to do quite a lot of singing and they had a good record collection. We into quite a lot of jazz. Um, and so... We used to do a lot of singing in my house, strangely enough. Um, also, a bit of an odd confession. Well, when you ask soul singers, they usually say, well, I got started in the church. I used to quite enjoy singing hymns in school. Not a very cool admission, but uh, uh, I, I did. And then later, the transistor radio and, you know, pop radio was my sort of entry point into that. Obviously, pop music has always been big with young people. I also started messing around at quite an early age with... Um, a little dictation machine that my uncle gave me, a reel-to-reel -reel thing, and making sounds and getting... Um, I used to do what my mum called sounds and light shows, where I got these, like, toy robots and this little cool moon vehicle that flashed and made noises and sort of moved around. And, and I'd invite my family to come in and sell them a ticket for one pence so they could see the sound and light show. <laughs> so I'm sort of still doing the same thing now, basically, <laughs> making weird noises from toys. That's amazing. It was the predecessor for all of what's going on with the EDM world, because that's essentially what an EDM show is, right? It's a sound and light show. Well, that's right. And in fact, I've been, I've been sort of pretty much equally involved with visuals as, as with music for about the last 25 years. Um, and that's proved a very fruitful direction. I call it AV, the art of audiovisual relationship, meaning that you know sound and vision go naturally together and you can connect audio and visual in so many different ways. Um, and that's been a big part of our, our work as well over the last few years. So I'm equally interested in visuals as in music, actually. Mm -hmm. And it's been nice to see, you know, up from sort of humble beginnings that now if you go to a big electronic music show, you'll see that electronic visuals are um, accepted as an important part of the entertainment. 
So it's taken like a couple of decades for that to get established, but it's well in the frame now, I think. Yeah, I think it's a little more than accepted at this point. It's 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 expected as part of the show. So um, that's that's incredible that that you were a part of that at such an, a, a, an early age. Um, so can you talk a little bit about? I mean, you've got this band Cold Cut. How did you get into music on a professional level? Because obviously, you know, starting in singing the hymn, the hymns, all the way to making music at a professional level. What was that journey for you? Well, it's a long journey. I'll just have to like surmise it very quickly but i did have a little posse of geeky friends when i was at school and we did find a bunch of disco equipment that the youth club were were selling out so we bought it for five pounds um, and started doing little discos at school and that was in the mid 70s i was about 14 and uh then i my mate and i decided to build a synthesizer out of a kit um, out of a magazine so we each built a little synth analog synth um and also, I started getting into computers in the mid 70s as well. I read a book called The Shockwave Rider, which was the kind of first cyberpunk book, blew my mind. And I thought like, yeah, I want to be that guy hacking the system and fighting back using computer networks. Um, didn't quite work out like that, but I got a job in computing. Um, but that was after, I, when I went to college, I did biochemistry, but the, what the best uh, part of that was getting to know a bunch of guys who are still my best mates. And basically we were into getting high and listening to music and, and uh, doing parties and collecting records. So that was a big formative experience. And then when I moved to London, um, I got the bug to learn to be a hip hop DJ, which there wasn't much information around at the time, just a few videos, but there was records out there like Wheels of Steel by Grandmaster Flash. And I started learning to do that. Um, and after a while, I jacked in being a computer program and became a DJ full time. And that was in 1987. And that was when I met Jonathan and we started Cold Cut and decided to put a record out inspired by these cut-up records that were coming out of New York. Very influential, Double D and Steinsky, a name I always like to check. That without those records, I wouldn't be sitting here talking to you. So yeah. that was when Cold Cut started rolling. Very much inspired by hip hop. Yeah, amazing. So I'd love to move over to the present. What all are you involved with today? Well... Um, right now, you know, it's a weird time for the world. So I'm sitting at home, getting on with some music, some projects, and um, my main baby, which has just sort of been been born, actually, a couple of months ago, we released a new version of what was previously called Ninja Jam, and this is called Jam Pro, and um, it's kind of a, a beat instrument, and in a way, I've been working on it for 25 years, and I sort of now got it to a pretty funky stage where I can use it as an instrument, and we've released it for iPad, as well so that other people can get into that and play with it as well and that is actually a real passion of mine to try and create the ultimate beat instrument and then share it with people as well and uh, enjoy making music with other people as well so that's a major project at the moment that's now out the door and out in the world and and people can get that on the ipad uh, app store yeah that's right and um actually we've got a an even more of a sale now so it's a uh, it's 60% off. So it's only about, I think, $8 or something like that, which uh, one of the guys from Music Tech magazine said he thought it should be $100 at least. So that was a good uh, big up. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm um, enjoying learning this new instrument because uh, even, you know, I'm it's so flexible that there's a, a lot to learn. And uh, actually, I'm hoping that there's some people out there are going to take it and take it further than I've taken it myself. I think it's quite an open-ended instrument. Yeah. So what would be some of the, just from, from my standpoint, I'm always, you know, I work in logic as a songwriter. I work in mm. pro tools. I, I have Ableton. I'm not that great at Ableton. Mm. Um, I, I, I have the little OP one, you know, the little teenage thing. I got one of those. Yeah. Marvelous. So, and yeah. So where would this something like this kind of fit into the spectrum? Like, is this a replacement for a DAW? Do you use it with a DAW? Is it a live thing? Is it a studio thing? I just asked like seven questions, but maybe you can kind of clarify there. Thank you. The answer is yes to all of that. Um, but it's also great to work in combination with other things. Uh, I, it doesn't really replace a DAW. Um, Jam is not about editing. And I think editing is... You know, it's all very well freaking out and having a good time and producing loads of stuff. But at the end of it, the editor has to come in and say, no, not good enough. No, that bit's too long. Chop, chop, chop. And 
I think it's good to be respectful of people's attention. I used to be into sort of just letting it all hang out and making endless tracks, but actually short is good. And that's where your DAW comes in. As an instrument, I think jam's got a lot of potential. And, it, you know, say you've got an OP1, for instance, you can get a 20 quid sound card like this. Um, I've got one here, this Behringer UCA222, $20, man, a wicked little thing. And you can plug that into your iPad with a, a little USB adapter. And that means you can record any sources into the iPad and you can record straight into jam. So I can set that up, got my OP1 there, play little riffs on that and then record that into jam. It, it works so that it always records loop safe. So, you know, it drops in and drops out on the beat. So you don't spend a lot of time editing your loops, makes it very quick, which is something that I'm into. Um, you can also, and this is a big plus for the iPad actually, it works with what's called inter app audio. Um, I'm not, you know, a big Apple fanboy, but I do have to give them props for always having prioritized making audio work pretty well on both their or all the Apple devices. And that has been so on the iPad as well with InterApp Audio. I've got access to all these great apps that people have written, things like Elastic Drums, uh, Patterning as drum machines, for example, uh, D DM1, is it called? Fantastic. Uh, uh, apps that people have written, I can plug them straight in and all the synths and stuff as well, the Animoog, the um, audio kit guys, that free synth, uh, unbelievable, that audio kit one. There's a ton of great music apps and they're much cheaper than, well, certainly than the equivalent hardware and even than the VST uh, plugins for synths and drum machines tend to, tend to be. So got access to all those. They, with audio bus, which is a program, or AUM is another one, using InterApp Audio, you can route them directly into Jam. And so you've got access to all these fantastic sound sources and you can record samples into Jam. And then with Jam, you can process them and you can play with them. So I find that is a, a pretty useful music making environment. I love it. And so I'm always big on no listener left behind. Um, I, 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 I totally love, and I can nerd out on this side of stuff, but just to really break it down, so somebody could record, they could plug a guitar into the iPad, sample it with the app, they could plug a vocal mic into it, sample with that. Does it have built-in instruments that, that you can just get going as well? No, you know, I took the, um, the attitude that I wasn't going to try and be Ableton and put all the sources into it as well. And that was, you know, when we discovered that we could root all these other great sound sources in. There didn't seem to be a lot of point in doing that. And there was a limit to what we could pack into the app. But having this ability to pipe in the other apps works really well. Um, having said that, we also, when you get the app, it comes with a lot of basically uh, sound sets, which are collections of samples that we've made, which all work together. Um, some are for sale, some are free, but it, some of them are pretty great and you know they're co copyright free which means that you can take them and make your own track and you can put it out and uh, have a, a result with that so sound uh, sound sources are samples in jam gotcha yeah so so samples rather than somebody plugging in a midi keyboard and playing in an instrument that's yeah. right now you plug in your midi keyboard and you can control animoog and then you can record that into jam that's the way that we've done it and you recommend using audio bus for that Audio bus or AUM is the other one, AUM. Okay. We'll, we'll include uh, in, in our description um, links to all of that stuff for, for people. So the, the big question, sorry, go ahead. Well, to just complete that story, um, when you're in Jam, you've got all your loops loaded up, you've, you've got your set there, and you're able to now perform on it. Hit record, but you select stem recording, right? You can then freak out playing and jamming as long as you want, when you stop recording, all the different tracks within Jam are saved as individual WAV files. And you can press a button and export that as a zip, which you can then load into your log Logic or Ableton or whatever. You've got each of those stems there separate. So typically, there's four main tracks. would be like drums, bass, keyboards, and effects. Then there's another channel called Stabs. Then there's a sub bass channel. That's one inbuilt sound source. There is a sub bass generator, which is quite fun. Um, and then a stereo mix. And so all those seven stereo stems come up for you to then take into your door and chop around, reorganize, add extra stuff to. So that really turns it into a production instrument, the stem recording. Gotcha. That, that makes total sense. 
man, I'm excited to dive in. So why iPad and no iPhone? Well, the original Ninja Jam app was available for iPhone. We even converted it for Android, but it's kind of hard to get it to be playable on an iPhone. Actually, we have got it working on an iPhone. It's just, it's a bit fiddly. I mean, if you look at the interface, even on say an iPad Pro, yeah, I'll just fire it up for a sec so you can see. The, um, it, it's quite packed. Um, I, I, I've, there are quite a few apps out there where I personally, I find they're a bit too fiddly to use and they try to pack on too much. And I didn't want to do that. So I tried to keep things at a reasonable size. Having said that, on the iPhone, we can configure the screens differently so that everything's bigger. You just can't have everything on screen at the same time. The great thing about having a nice big device like this, the iPad Pro, um, or even a normal iPad, is that using the play screen, okay, so this is the play screen. Okay, I mean, it'd be better to look at this online, obviously, but you get an idea. Yeah, and for people who are people for people who are listening audio wise, you should definitely head over to our YouTube and watch because I, I love seeing some some little live demonstrations as well too. And that's he's got it kind of in front of us. I, I've got to do a few more of those actually, but there's some st good stuff on YouTube that will give you the idea. But basically, with this this screen, the play screen, you've got access to all the main performance functions of the app. You can dip, go into other screens and dive in and tweak things, the effects and so on. But this is a great place to perform. Um, and it's difficult to have that all on a little iPhone screen. Um, however, if you do get Ninja Jam, which is, in fact, is kind of the demo version of this, um, there is a mode where you can have all the screens on, on one screen, multi-screen layout, it's called. Um, and you can just about, I, I have jammed on it. In fact, you can <laughs> see an app, um, a demo on YouTube called Take One, which I made, which is a two minute demo using the iPhone of the original Ninja Jam app. I called it take one because it was one take, but it took me 200 takes to do it. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So. Yep. I love it. Well, hey, tell me about the process of moving from Ninja Jam to Jam Pro. You, you kind of mentioned that Ninja Jam is a little bit of the light version. What, what was the reason for the name change and new direction? Well, it, you know, it's very much a development, basically. Um, we're doing this on probably about, you know, a fifth of the budget that a normal software company would do. I've got, I've built, I found my guys now. I've since Ninja Jam. Long story short, it took me a while to find a great team to work with, but I've got uh, some guys now who are the team, and they're they're great. We never have any argy bargy. There's never any arguments or anything. We just get on with it, and they're really hot coders. Um, so a big shout out to Chris in Florida, Antoine in uh, Lille in France, and Wes in Australia. So. Um, you know, lots down to their abilities, these guys, and they're, they're really into it. Um, and, you know, yeah, it just takes time to get stuff done, especially if you haven't got millions of pounds of, of budget. And also, um, it's been a certain discovery process uh, of finding out what this new version would be like. You know, I, I call it, it's a bit like a modular synth for beats. Um, and it took us a while to get that concept and finesse it and and realize it um but you know i intend to keep on with this trip actually it, it, i think we've created the world's most advanced beat instrument and i want to keep I th this can go a lot further so hopefully buy a copy help support us and we just i just want to make something brilliant and share it with people basically um i love it so you know there's already a feature list this big um and yeah we think we can take it a lot further yeah, I love it. So, man, just I, I'm just really curious. I mean, you, you mentioned you're able to do this on a fifth of the budget that most companies normally need. Like, how, I mean, how much does something like this cost to build? I mean, if you can even put a number to it. Yeah. Um, I think we've probably spent a couple of hundred thousand on it. Yeah. But that's but, over a seven year period, you know. Yeah. Um, but, you know, software development is expensive and, uh, I, I could, you know, if I'd had absolutely the whole thing crystal clear in my mind from the beginning, could maybe have had some shortcuts. But what I've been doing is over the years, I've been using it live. I've been using it to produce with and, and particularly to play live with for cold cut shows. Um, so it's been like working with a prototype and I go back to the guy and say, no, this didn't work. And, you know, this needs to be like this. So it, it, it's some, um, you know, Picasso... Um, 
well, he said, uh, I don't seek, I find. I, I, but then Einstein said, how do I work? I grope. I think we're more on the sort of been a bit, quite a lot of groping going on uh, to find the right shape, which we want here. Yeah. So, I mean, I, and I guess you, you may have just answered this question, but, you know, building an app, like what, what is it that makes it so expensive? Is it just that you have a team and it just takes a long time to sort of figure that out and it's a lot of experimentation? I mean, you know, if you haven't noticed, tech runs the world nowadays pretty well. Um, and that's a whole riff in itself that we could sure. get into, whether that's a good or bad idea, <laughs> but um, uh, good or bad thing. But, um, you know, software development is expensive. Um, coders are highly in demand, uh, people that can do that stuff. I used to code. I taught myself out of a magazine when I was 15 in the mid-70s, but it's got a lot more complicated since then. I can't even deal with it now. It's, it, it boggles my mind. I can have a realistic idea of what's possible with code and sometimes the shortest way to get there. I have a good feel for it, but I don't actually do the work. And so I have to have people who can and they are you know, in a position to earn a living from it, which is good. And if they weren't working with me, they'd probably be making more money working at other software companies because coding's in demand at the moment. Um, and I don't expect that to change actually. So yeah. that uh, gets expensive. Yeah. So, and you, you say this has really been kind of a 25 year process creating this. Um, a lot of people see apps like this that are kind of popping up overnight. Why is making a product like this such a big process? You know, I've just been reading a book um, about Raymond Scott. Do you know that cat? He I, invented the sequencer. Yeah. Yes. Fascinating. Yeah. He's yeah. a very successful jazz musician, but what he was really into was inventing new types of electronic music instrument. Um, and, uh, you know, it just is a long journey to come up with something new. When someone's done it, it's easy to follow up behind and make a copy or, you know, iterate, improve it. Um, a second mover advantage, they call that sometimes. But to come up with new stuff is quite difficult. Um, having said that, I wouldn't claim necessarily that there's that much in the app that's new. I'm quite good at sort of sellotaping other people's ideas together. <laughs> there's, a, there's a few good licks in there, I think. The buffer shuffle idea is, is one of them. And then the, the drill to where we found it just by using small um, finger touches, you can actually have quite subtle control over effects. You don't necessarily need a big XY pad to do it. Um, that's been... Uh, a, a nice um, innovation that took a while to come up with that. Um, so I think I've lost the thread of the question, but... Um, no, yeah, just, I mean, it, it's, I think you're answering it. I, so the process... We, we, start, we started off with two decks and a mixer, basically. Yeah. Know? And yeah. then we added a drum machine, and then we got into computer sequencing. And then, you know, fast forward, when these touch devices came out, I thought this can be a great interface. But it's, if you look, actually... If I rewind to the mid '90s, when we we had a program called DJAM, and that was just something that we used ourselves for Cold Cuts Live Show, it was a four-channel loop mixer. So that's very much the same concept, actually. Mm. So w the process of this, like, I'm just I'm I'm fascinated by it. I love the entrepreneurial journey. I love yeah the Raymond Scott story. Um, what is the what is the process? I mean, it, a, lot, a lot of people might think it looks something like, is it idea, then software development, then like user interface, then testing, then release, or like what's what's the actual process look like? Well, there's very little of a plan there. It's a journey, it's a trip, it's a mess, you know, like human existences. Um, I'm just making it up as I go along, basically. I, you know, the only answer to that would be to give you a detailed step-by-step -step, uh, account of the journey, which I hope I've done in a, in a summarized way. Um, it's exciting. I've always liked stuff that was cool and new. I was just thinking just now, I was listening to a track and someone's playing the piano. I was like, wow, this sounds great. And I, I can't play the piano, but I'm still entranced by music. And in a way, I try to save myself time by not learning to play the piano by using technology. It didn't save any time, but it's given me a, a trajectory which I've I've enjoyed and um, and I'm still enjoying and still sort of peddling, peddling along, it, yeah. uh, having having a good time. So it, there's no plan basically other than to do cool new stuff and hopefully share it and have a good time. 
I love it. So, so what are you all doing to promote it and market it and get it out there? Is is Nam a part of the thing? Is having a website? Po- obviously, podcast. We don't really have the budget and the the connections to get into Nam and and stuff like that. Um, it, it, we're more just a sort of word of mouth thing. Dudes like yourself who are interested in new stuff that give us a chance to speak about it. Um, I need to make more videos of um, of using the app. It's quite cool because on, on the iPad, you can record, you can do a screen recording very easily. And then we have a setting in the app where it records, it gives a circle around each of your finger touches. So just doing that, you can show people pretty clearly exactly what you're doing. So we've got a bunch of how-to videos, but I want to do more sort of fun performance videos showing, you know, um, having a good time freaking out on the app and get those up there. Yeah. Um, you know, it, we haven't got a big budget for marketing and so on. And honestly, I sometimes I have an ambivalent attitude to the whole thing about advertising and marketing. Because no one really likes adverts. Sorry, <laughs> there's any adverts. Yeah, yeah. Do you yeah. know what I mean? And we're, everything is so sold nowadays. Everything is marketed. We're we're the target for all kinds of marketing for everything. And you know. When I got into music, my passion for music, it didn't come out of marketing. It came out of me and my mates getting into something for our own enjoyment. And um, I sort of like things to rewind to that position. So I'm never going to sell, be selling this hard. I've made something. We have made something. We think it's really wicked. And it's out there. And for those people that want to dive in and have a look and see if it tickles their fancy, terrific. It's never going to sell a million copies. I'm okay with that. I've got my instrument and I'm having a great time. Yeah, I love it. And I guess with, you know, this is a little bit of a sidestep, but I'm just fascinated as far as, you know, when people think of somebody that starts a record label, like you don't strike me as an overly business type thinker. You're, you're more the, the creator, the lightning in a bottle, and then, you know, put it out there for people, which I love. So how how does something like, you know, uh, Ninja become a thing where you're working with over sixty artists, some of the biggest artists in, in electronic music? How, how does like how does that all happen? Have you had a kind of a person? Obviously, you know, Peter Quick has been running it. So we have great people. I mean, Peter, you know, so much of Ninja Tune's success is down to his his hard work, and Pete's very good with people. He's known as the nice guy of the music business, which is a great accolade to have. Yeah. Um, I think if it had been left to me, I'd probably be bankrupted the company at this stage. So, um, <laughs> uh, but it's, then it's a balance. It's about finding good people to work with that can bring their strengths to um, to a joint enterprise. I'm into collaboration and cooperation, um, and that's been, I think, the secret to our success. With John and I, for instance, we made we started to have when we started we started to have arguments about well I made this and you're getting more money from that and we made a quite a simple arrangement to just split everything 50-50 and just call it cold cut and split it between us equally that's worked really well I love it Hey well as we're wrapping up we want to do our lightning round so just a few rapid fire questions are you ready for that Sure What is your favorite DAW I have to go for Ableton Okay What's your favorite musical collaboration you've ever been a part of Oh, that's really a tough one. Um, you know, I'd say the most recent project we've done is called Keller Kettler. It's going to be an album, new album out in June. And it's all real music, collaborations with some South African jazz musicians and a bunch of London jazzers and some uh, anti ballers from the States, Tony Allen, uh, Fela Kuti's old drummer. For me, this has been the most enjoyable album I've worked on so far. It's been a really great collaboration. So right up to date, yes, now now is the time for my favorite collaboration, that one. Awesome. Well, we'll, we'll make sure to link to it as well. Thank you. Um, what was the first instrument you ever owned? I ever owned? Yeah. It was a... Uh, first instrument I ever owned, I think, was a, a, a rubbishy old Farfisa organ that I bought when I was at college, but I never properly learned to play it. I have a good drum machine. Okay. <laughs> What's one goal that you want to accomplish over the next year? A goal for accomplishing over the next year would be to get jam into 
the hands of as many people as possible and see people enjoying it and having a good time. I love it. Well, um, we are going to do a quick deep dive into your hardware product, which is uh, a delay unit. So um, if people are interested in that, they can go to madeitmusic.com, access the deep dives right there, as well as the show notes, all of the resources, all of the things that Matt has mentioned today. We're linking there. Um, Matt, this has been an absolute blast. Thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you so much for the support and interest. Keep on doing what you're doing. Great. What's up? Thank you for watching the Made It in Music podcast season three. If you want to check out any of the other episodes from season three, click up here. And we talk in the show about these really cool deep dives with all this extra bonus content. And if you want access to all of those, click here.